Seriously, if I'm operating a funeral home today, I will be doubling down on premiums. You're securing future market share. And it's totally stealth mode. Like, your comparison, like, seriously, it's like, your comparison do not, no, you just stole a case away mm -hmm. from them. Yeah. So I'd be literally be doubling down on pre-needs. Okay. It's a good strategy. And that's what I always recommend to our clients, our funeral home clients. If you do not have the time to be working on pre-needs, then really just hire a good third-party marketer. And yeah. it will really help you grow your pre-need securing your market share for the next 10 years. Welcome to the Direct Cremation Podcast with your hosts, Tyler Yamasaki and Will DeMichaelis. Hi, thank you for joining us on the Direct Cremation Podcast. I'm your host, Tyler Yamasaki, CEO of Parting Pro. And as always, I'm here with my co-host, Will DeMichaelis, former manager of the Omega Society, a cremation brand that served over 4,500 families per year. So today's guest is a return guest. I'd put him up against anyone for the title of smartest person in death care. Uh, some call him a genius. I call him a friend. He's a food connoisseur. He's the man with the best ad campaigns in the entire industry. He's a CEO of Ring Ring Marketing. And he's also one of the nicest guys in death care. Please give a warm welcome to Welton Hong. Hey, Welton. Welton. Hey, Welton. Hey, Welton. <laughs> Definitely not smartest in the room, but I love to eat. <laughs> yeah, you're one of, one of, for sure. One of, one of. One of. Yeah. So we've had you on before, and I think most people are going to know Ring Ring, but for anyone new to death care or anyone that's living under a rock, can you tell us what Ring Ring does? <laughs> right. So uh, we help care homes and cemeteries these days. Uh, predominantly, we help funeral homes generate more at need calls, and sometimes we do help them with pre need calls if they're not working with a third party marketer. And at need side is going to be pretty simple. I wish there were a lot more strategies, but predominantly it's going to be search engine marketing and helping them with their websites, updating their website for conversions, and getting more reviews. That's predominantly what we're kind of well known for search, higher converting website, and reviews. Nice. Got it. So that's yeah. everything. Basically, when I search for a funeral home on Google, I will find one of your clients. Their websites will look the best and convert <laughs> from a website visitor to hopefully a paid case. All correct? Right. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, surprisingly enough, you were one of our first guests. Uh, I think one of the first 10, and uh, it's probably been about a year since we spoke yeah. to you. All right. You know, I think at that time, we were just kind of coming out of COVID. We were a little bit out of it, but we were just coming out of it. But I know that COVID had a pretty profound effect on death care in terms of, well, on all aspects of it. What changes have you seen in, in your side of the business um, oh, yeah. or in death care marketing in the last year? Oh, yeah. Right. Definitely messaging has changed quite a bit just because overall death rate is down. So right, roughly that's a 14% if you compared to last year. So it's definitely very, very hard these days if a funeral homeowner is comparing the last year or the year prior. So I'm like me personally I call those the outlier years. Right. Sure. Those are totally outliers. So yeah. it's better uh, to go back and reflect and really compare to 2018, 19, right? And that's a little bit better comparison though. Uh, as long as you're doing, if you're overall trending up in your call volume compared to 18, 19, obviously 2020, 21, 22 is kind of like a huge outlier. But as long as you're looking, if you're comparing this year, it's better to compare back to 2019. Look at the same time period. Sure. As long as you're trending up, you're doing well. So that's one thing to look at. Second thing I typically would guide our clients to look at is um, a better way to think about this is if that's the overall key, uh, overall death rate is down 14%. And please do not beat yourself up for it. Like, do, like this is what I say. A lot of owners, they set aggressive goal for this year and they're not meeting it. And most sure. likely they will not meet it year end. Yeah. And they're beating themselves up for not meeting their year and go, but their year and go is comparing to last year. They want to continue to trend up. 
right? We all do. Even my business, I want to trend up. Right? Nobody wants to trend down. Yeah. yeah but yeah. overall, right? If we know, just look at a stock market just for fun, right? If the overall market's down 14%, your overall stock portfolio, that's a NASDAQ down 14%. But if you're only down your, your overall portfolio, you're only down 5%. Man, that means you're doing outrageously good job, <laughs> right? Not yeah. even think about right growing, but if you're only down 5%, you're doing much better than everybody else out there. Sure. And that's the same thing. Uh, here and there, we do see some unicorns, right? They're beating, right? They're not going trending down at all. But overall average, again, we're talking average, average down 14%. That means some are down 20%, right? So overall, if you're not, if you're doing better than 14%, that means you're eating into somebody else's market share though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's what we've been kind of saying overall, just messaging wise, not beating yourself up for it. Okay. Is, um, is it, is it difficult to get funeral homeowners to buy into that kind of reset definitely. of expectations? Definitely. Even, Right, even me, right, yeah. even myself. It's like it's not happy to see hey, your business down compared to last year. Nobody loves to see yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it it right. seems like it's a it's a data driven expectation reset. Right, it's very data driven. So during strategy calls, we have strategy calls with our clients month to month basis. So we'll always pull the national average data to kind of share with them and compare it to where they are so far. And of course, also look, looking at public traded, right? Your SCI, your Parklawn, right? Some of these public traded companies and see what we can gather and share that with our clients, right? Even they're not beating, right? And they all are beating national average down 14%, right? Some are down 8%, some are down 5%, but even them, they're not raising, they're not, right? Increasing the case volume. Sure. Even yeah somebody with such more resources, but everybody's really trying to get more, right? And so looking at the case volume, they're trying to grow their net profit. That's probably the most meaningful metric to look at. It's like, who cares how many calls you made? It, at the end of the day, who cares? Well, it's like, yeah. obviously we all care, but at the end of the day, net profit is the one that really does matter, <laughs> right? Cash flow. Right, that's yeah. how we can reinvest back in Nectar. Well, right. well, Tim, I guess my question for you then on that is if competition is getting fiercer, there's less deaths around, doesn't that mean that your cost to acquire a case is going to go up? So you're going to pay more per click. You're going to, you know, you you and your, your competitor are going to be bidding on the same keywords, but oh, yeah. now for less people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So... Tyler brought up a good point. So this is the year I personally think it's probably the hardest year to be running a fair home this year. So overall death rate is down. Inflation, right? We all know, right? Everything's more expensive. Cremation on the rise, right? Um, your revenue per call is going down, right? Cost to acquire a call is higher. So overall, it's just much harder to be operating if you're home this year, though, yeah. uh, definitely much ha harder. Cost per click, as you noted, it's more than before, <laughs> right? Yeah. And anytime it mature, the technology becomes mature, right? And Google Ads is not new, but it's still relatively new in the last few years. And now it's everybody's doing it. <laughs> yeah, of course. Right? Of course, the cost is going up. <laughs> yeah. Is there any data to suggest what the trend may be next year? If the demand pull forward continues into next year, or, or are we going to see a bounce back, like a rubber band effect, anything to indicate anything like that? All right. I personally don't know. I, me personally, I'm counting on a few things. Hopefully, hopefully, I'm, I'm talking about hopefully. Sure. Now, first <laughs> is expectation. So hopefully next year, early next year, they're comparing to 2023 now. So yeah. right, it's a little just expectation reset. Yeah, they're not yeah. right now. Finally, they realize, hey, those COVID years are totally outliers. Right. That's overall uh, mental shift. Mm -hmm. But hopefully next year, we're starting to see the baby boomers generation starting to really take yeah. right effect. Right. Um, right. And then I'm hoping, again, this is like I've been through a recession 2010, 11, 12. 
And that's when we also work with home improvement contractors, right? Those are the years when everybody start pulling back their ad spend, right? That's what everybody does. Typically during downturn, right? Those who more and more people are pulling away from advertising, that's when the cost per click starts to get a little bit cheaper. Those who stick around are enjoying the lower cost per click. Lower, doesn't matter, it's like Google ads, anything across the board, right? These, as everybody start pulling away from it, that's when things get a little cheaper now. Yeah. yeah. Well, going back on your question, I mean, when Barbara was on, Barbara Chemist, um, you know, she mentioned that based on their data that COVID accelerated the deaths of like a million people who are going to probably die within the next five years, five years right? Yeah. So, I mean, just looking at that, if right. we took that in a very broad sense, mm -hmm. that's what, 200,000 deaths right. each year for the next five years that already happened. So, right. yeah. right. so you can expect she, that, she, meaning, yeah. Yeah, she, she estimated that we could have a slow few years ahead of us. Oh, general. yeah. And that, that's how it's described in right. the industry. It's yeah. slow right now, you know, and oh, it just yeah. might be a little bit muted in yeah. terms of case volumes right. um, or even decreases that you've seen. That's, right. that's interesting. I'd be interested to see how that goes. And I mean, there are other things that play in the industry as well with mergers and consolidations right. and, and yeah. th those companies that really effectively use their capital to market effi efficiently and shore right. up back office operations. They, they actually have oh, yeah. money to outperform in these markets and right. really capture market share and expand for when that real su silver tsunami comes because they have right. all their pieces and infrastructure in place. Right. Yeah. 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 The whole overall operation efficiency is so critical, right? When for the last two and a half years, everybody's like, nobody can keep up. Everybody's so busy, but yeah. this is the time. doesn't matter what type of business you're operating. Everybody's working on operation efficiency. Right, your process, yeah. your internal workflow, right? Anything you can, right? Especially with AI these days, there's so many things you can do to streamline things. Yeah. Oh, right. Walton, speaking of the different yeah. business types, I know you've kind of recently kind of gotten more into cemetery. Yes. Advertising as well. So you kind of now do funeral homes. I know that you do, you know, some of the cremation brands as well. Yes. You also do cemeteries. Are you seeing certain shifts happening within the three, the types of different death care businesses and like what's being more challenging, what's less challenging, mm -hmm. what's taking off, what's not? Right. Uh, the pretty side is much easier, <laughs> much easier these days. These, right. It's top of mind. Relatively, for example, present day, if we run a Facebook ad, right, generating pretty interest. It's much more economical. It's on top of folks' mind compared yep. to three, four years ago. Much easier yep. on the preening side. Yep. The acne side, definitely a little more challenging, right? Just yeah. overall less death going around on the preening side. And seriously, if I'm operating a funeral home today, I will be doubling down on preenings. You're securing future market share. And it's totally stealth mode. <laughs> like yeah. your compares, like seriously, it's like your comparison do not know you just stole a case away from them. Yeah. So I'd be literally be doubling down on pre needs. Okay. It's a good strategy. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's right. If you and this is what I always recommend to our clients, our fear home clients, if you do not have the time to be working on pre needs, then really just right hire a good third party marketer. Right. There's a few out there they are pretty legit. Yeah. And they will really help you grow your pre-need yeah right? and securing your market share for the next 10 years yeah. right so if you look at very the ones that do relatively well uh throughout these couple of years not only right are they focused on at need right marketing but a lot of i'll say mm -hmm. like 50 percent of their cases came from pre-needs they wrote 10 years ago yeah. right so it's that that's how some got very very large in size right 500 to 1,000 calls, I can bet you those didn't come, your traditional fair home, most of those didn't come from just at me. So a lot of those are just the pre-needs they wrote five to 10 or 10 years ago. Right? I would really be doubling down pre-needs today though. Yeah, that, that's great advice. It's yeah. great advice. And I hope that gets some owners over the 
hump and fear of trying to work on that as a project and executing hiring a sales team or just, you know, committing to outsourcing it, you know, right. especially baby boomers. It's on right. top of their mind, right? Yeah. You, you don't have sure. to wait for them. <laughs> no. just, just no. like, right? Let's start writing, you know, right? Work with third party market or have lunch and learns, send up some guides. I really get it active. Yeah. We need program going. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. That's smart. Well, then I wanted to ask you about a series that you wrote on for website conversions. Right. I found it incredibly informative and actionable for funeral homes. I wanted to see if you could summarize the three-part series you posted on your blog for our audience. Right. Yeah, I'll go over some just very, very quick tips out of that. Nothing new. I will still say nothing new yeah. in general, but still the most fundamental is you got to have a very, very good <laughs> mobile friendly website that is still the most fundamental definitely more than 50 percent of what visits these days are on this little tiny device uh, unfortunately even me i have to force myself to be auditing websites from this little tiny device but i'm so used to be looking at even my own website from desktop but most of my clientele they're looking at website from mobile so definitely is to make sure Go on your own website via this little tiny device and really swipe around, right? How hard it is to find your phone number. You got to yeah. make sure the phone number sticks. Right. Sticky, right? Making it sticky. That way, whenever they're swiping on your website, right? Yeah, make true. sure to tap to call. Right. Or else it's so frustrating to be looking yeah. at phone numbers. <laughs> I encountered that with our website. I thought the website design was beautiful. And, the, and on the desktop, the phone number was clickable. And it was this nice shade of blue that matched the rest of the website. And right. then I go on mobile and the font color like blended in with the sky of the picture that was mm. next to it on the desktop. Right. So it made the, the phone number invisible. And I was like, oh, wow, I, this, <laughs> is a, this is a huge problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that stuff happens all the time. That's really good advice. Right. And then yeah. second, of course, is making sure your website loads fast, which is like, like no brainer. But however, what I seeing on some of these websites, as you start loading more and more obituaries onto your website, some of these are very, very high resolution photos. Mm. Right. And yeah. then throughout, right, a couple of years, the website started to really, right, the overall website got very, very slow. So definitely just to make sure the website Right. Overall user friendly, it's fast to load. And then most is really look at Google Analytics. That is still the best metric to look at is once people come to your website, where are they going? Where are they dropping off from? Right. And that's still very, very critical. And I totally get it. Most users coming to a website, 80%, 90% are going straight to the obituaries, but oh, wow. the other 10 to 15%, 20%. Where are they going? Are they going to, right? Are they checking, right? They're going through the e-commerce tool. Where are they dropping up from, right? Those are things you kind of, you should know. And then- So do you have some benchmark yeah. metrics of what you like to see from a website? Yeah. So typically, um, for sure. So we have an internal checklist that we go through. And I'll talk about a few things typically is missing <laughs> from these websites. and. Typically, I would say first thing here is it's very hard whenever you go on a website to tell how they are different. It's very, very hard to tell. And I'm talking even more specifically a traditional firm's website. Yeah. If you go on their homepage, you can't tell how are they different. There's yeah. nothing on there talks about, and everybody talks about more or less the same thing. It would be around multi-generation, 30 years in business. <laughs> That's not strong. Multi-generation multi compassion. Right. right. Unique. Yeah. You, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I would definitely really focus on really carving out how you are different mm -hmm. on the homepage. That's interesting. So so kind of like a call to be a bit more daring in, in oh, yeah. differentiating yourself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Good I, it's hard to do. It's hard conv to convince funeral homeowners, especially traditional firms, to do. They almost like to blend in almost. Because it's worked so well for them, I think, up till now. But it's a good call out. It really is. And I think it, sh it, it shouldn't go understated to 
take that step to just step out in front of the crowd right. and in front of your competitor down the street and so on and say, you know, be a little bit more daring, especially with your web copy. Right. Yeah. Cause I can guarantee if I call up any fair home today, verbally, they can, they will tell me over the phone how they're different. Most of them know how they're different. Yeah. It's just not translated onto their website. <laughs> right, 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 right. They got to right. be bragging on their website, though. That's where most families start their research from. Yeah, yeah. And then second, I typically see that's missing. Um, and more often on direct cremation, websites are going to be faces. I still say faces means trust, right? If you l really look at a website, if you go on there, there's really no mention of, right, who they are, what they do, how they're different. And then faces, I can bet you a website with faces, without faces, the one with faces are going to convert higher. Just people trust them a little bit more. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I definitely would, even a direct cremation the website, I would really highly suggest to have faces on there. Um, right. And then third, <laughs> I laugh about this um, quite a bit is, it's just so hard. If you go on these services pages, and they're all more or less the same. <laughs> Still, they're all more or less the same um, because they're all can templated websites, right? Nothing wrong with it. I still see typically people like funeral homeowners will ask me, hey, which website provider is the best? Uh, I will still say they're all pretty good these days, but you got to put in your own content onto these websites, right? They're right. nice off the shelf. But you got to put in your own content or else they're just going to be generic. It's not their issue. It's not, yeah. right, those wet providers issue. It's you got to be putting in your own content. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And if you're, and if you're scared to write your own content, which I, I've found that a lot of owners are, Use Chat GPT Yay! and work and work through <laughs> and work through work through you know three to five different phrasing of prompts oh, yeah. for an about oh, us yeah. page for your business. Fill in the blank of your business. Right. Fill in the you can fill in the tone that you want the, right. it to be in. Right. Compassionate, you exactly. know, exactly. Whatever you know, I, right. I, I it you, you'll be amazed. And it's and it's the really it's a really big difference starting oh, yeah. from zero. Than mm -hmm. starting from a rough draft. Oh, yeah. Editing a rough draft is much easier than starting from zero. Right. Yeah. Well, you touch on a good point. There's no more excuse for not having good copy on your website anymore. No. Right. You can yeah. just copy and paste whatever is on the homepage, for example, and you can train chat GPT. Hey, right. Write this in more colorful. You can put in your own prompts. Me personally, yeah. I love to write uh, sales copy. So I typically mm -hmm. will, like, there's a couple of them that I love a lot. One is John Carlton, right? I love John Carlton's style and then Gary Halpert. So I'll typically will train it. Hey, do you know who John Carlton is? That's the first prompt I will use, the copywriter. And then yeah. chat GPT for us say, hey, they will give a little bio on John Carlton. Then I will start writing, hey, write a uh, webinar, right? Um, or webinar copy in a tone of John Carlson, right? And then it will start to write. So you really got to figure out who you like out there. Yeah. That's kind of similar to your tone. That's smart. Right. I was using it the other day. I found a, on, for our old business, I went on the Google reviews. And I wanted to test ChatGPT's ability to respond to negative reviews. Oh, I saw one amazing. of your videos on LinkedIn and I said, I'm going to try this myself. <laughs> so I copied the one star review from Google. <laughs> I went into chat GBT and I said in a compassionate and Smart. empathetic tone, Smart. respond, respond to the following Google review for a business named the Omega society mm -hmm. quote, paste quote. Yes. And, and it was brilliant. Smart. And it's, it's, brilliant. Brilliant. it's still, and folks think it's cheating. I don't think it's cheating, right? You, you still have to edit though. Yeah, of course. Just, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. As someone, as someone who, like my my aunt, the president who I worked for, if we got a one or two star review, Welton, she would not sleep. Oh yeah. If we got it at six p.m., she would be irate. Reasonable. I mean, she would be irate, but then she would just steam over it and right. come in the next day and spend almost the entire business oh, yeah. day drafting the response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's eight hours of work. Oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do have a friend who owns multiple storage facilities. Oh wow. And um they actually use AI to respond to negative reviews left on their Google business page. Um there are services that have APIs where you can like right. yeah. send that. And right. you know, they still moderate it, mm-hmm. but eighty-five percent of the time the AI can respond in a way that is well written and better right. and you could just post that directly. And it saves, you know, hours and hours and hours, in Will's case, or Will uh, yes. said, he's case, eight hours of work time oh, yeah. to respond to a review. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that, and this is just conversational, I think that there's a huge opportunity for automating uh, customer contact responses for emails because the average funeral home owner or arrangement counselor generally doesn't have the best writing skills. That's not really what they're trained on. And I found that ChatGPT can write a well-drafted customer response Mm -hmm. of really any type, as long as the training is right, better than the the average arrangement counselor and certainly much faster. Oh, yeah. I think there's, I don't know what kind of integration. I, I would hope that that starts getting integrated soon because the, then the level, the level of customer care at the, at the email level, the whole, the, it's a rising tide, you know, and once, and, and you get much clearer communication, which mitigates risk. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think, I think that's coming and I think that's wise to do for any funeral home. Oh yeah. yeah. You know? I mean, just in any, any business, I would say even yeah. myself, if mm-hmm. I have to write like a company wide email or message, hey. <laughs> you know, I will sometimes run it through Chat GPT oh, or yeah. Bard or one of them just to get rid of grammar to make sure oh, yeah. that I'm saying everything effectively and concisely, yeah. right. not being too wordy, oh, making yeah. sure that my tone is consistent and I'm not, you know, and not yeah. things aren't being misread in a way because I didn't say them correctly or write them correctly. So I think it's a good tool. Right. Job postings. I actually tried it with job postings, like kind of with job description. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, my, I basically copy and paste in my current job description for the ones we're hiring on there. It's able to clean it up even better. Yeah. Like that's the yeah. best communication out there though. I used it for uh, a prompt for um, funeral home marketing video. Oh. So I, I, I say, write me a script for the direct cremation mortuary and basically prompted it for like with like three values of the company. Right. And it gave me like a 400 word script and it, it even, and even, even in the script, it says like pan in with this kind of music, <laughs> then go like, this is the script. Then, then pan in with this type of changing right. tone music. Oh, yeah. and it had phases through the whole thing. And it, it was like, this is, Amazing. If you if you're if you're if you want to add video to your funeral home's website yeah. and you don't know how to set it up or how to draft these scripts, but you know you you have pictures of your funeral home on Google, right. you can you know record pretty simple computer audio and right. use this as a template to get this stuff done really quickly. Oh yeah, yeah, very and, quickly. Um, I, that's why I'm like I'm loving this. Yeah. There's there's also um. I've been playing around with uh, AI avatars on, I think it's called Synesthesia. Okay. It's a, yeah. So you can basically pick like a presentation template and an AI avatar, nice. write a script, copy and paste the script into the AI, and it auto generates the video with a AI avatar, a nice. human looking avatar that delivers your script. Nice. Yeah, with full video editing capabilities to wow. add captions and everything. That's amazing. You know, so if, if if you wanted to, you could do an explainer video of the transportation process, right. the cremation process, what in, what is included in a witness, and if you don't right. want if you're camera shy, that's right. a great op- that's a great option. Oh yeah, yeah. It, right. it, it'll, it's, be it's, it'll, it'll be great on our AI hole. episode. <laughs> it was another AI episode. Oh yeah, we should yeah. definitely have a separate AI episode. <laughs> yeah, the, the the applications are are as wild as your mind can imagine. Oh yeah, you know, I yeah. I truly just like to use it as a as an analyst or personal assistant. Oh yeah, and a, and a sounding board to mm-hmm. like give me in information retrieval and work through these thoughts that I'm having, validate or reject. It's right. It's it's unbelievable. Oh yeah. Unbelievable. 
So, Walton, I wanted to talk to you a bit about what funeral homes should be working on, I think, in terms of marketing. I, I know last time, you know, you, you said that their Google business page is probably one of the most important things. But, you know, there's all different types of marketing, right? There's search engine marketing. So when I go to Google and I search for funeral homes in my area, you know, your Google business page or your business page will show up. Then you have things like local SEO which, you know, tend to be about services, then you have SEO, then you have social. Could you maybe give a description of what the differences are and what you should be, you know, what you think you should prioritize? All right. It really depends on whether it's a direct cremation business or a traditional firm, just because of the area, right? It's a, such a big difference, though, and in, in how far they're reaching out. So if we're talking about traditional firm, still Google business, right? Getting ranked in the three pack, we call that a three pack. Anytime you go on Google, you type in restaurants near me, right? Google recommends three of the closest restaurants nearby, right? Or the best, three of the closest, best restaurants nearby. If you're typing auto repair shop near me, it's going to recommend three of the best auto repair shop near me, right? So that proximity is very critical. So for a traditional firm, typically they're targeting three to five mile radius, still hands down, getting ranked in that local search, those three, one of those three recommended businesses, still hands down, they got to be focusing on that. For direct commission businesses, typically they go very, very far out. So I will still say definitely they want to be making sure they show up in their own city, but there's no way they'll be ranked in other cities. Because they're physic, it's proximity. They're not physically in that city. There's no way they'll be ranked. So that's why they're going to be very limited, right? You still got to make sure you show up in your own city if you own a direct commission business. But for direct commission business, most likely they're going to be leveraging more on Google ads because with Google ads, you get to choose where you want to show up, where you want to gain market share, right? And SEO, I love SEO. However, if you look at how SEO is present these days, typically if you go on Google, you see the ads at the top. Right beneath that is you're going to see the three pack. And if you look at SEO, traditional SEO organic search, that's where your website shows up on Google. They typically are pretty hidden down these days though, typically, right? So to really, to get that bang, for the buck, right? SEO takes a long time. And I really think these days, SEO, it does take a long time, at least a year, to come to fruition. And if you're not willing to wait, I would rather put that time and energy and money towards Google Ads. And with Google Ads, you've got to be very careful what you choose, right? What keywords you choose, or else you can waste quite a bit of money. Yeah. Right. It's real easy to waste money on Google Oh, yeah. Ads. Very easy to waste. Yeah. Right. But all these strategies still needs to be comboed with two things. One is got to have high converting website again, because right? you send traffic to your website. Yeah. If your website is lousy, <laughs> it doesn't matter how much traffic you're sending your way, right? And still, you need to have good reviews. Reviews are so critical. Yeah, reviews are the moat. Social proof, you just can't beat right. it, especially right. in such a human-oriented personal business. Right. It's so easy, too. It's the, the sales decision is so much easier when they Google you and you got 800 reviews with 4.9 stars. Right. I mean, it's free. If you have the yeah. case volume, yeah. if you have the case volume, you got to take advantage right. and capture those reviews. Right. Well, Tan, I know that the Google three pack ranking is a little bit of a algorithmic black box, but what have you seen? as some of the major factors that will contribute to you getting into that three pack. Yeah, the algorithm keeps on shifting year to year, but still the four fundamentals still do not change though. The true fundamentals. One of course is still your Google business profile, your actual business listing on Google. Mm -hmm. Most of right, very often if you're not ranked in there yet, it's you haven't put in a lot of information onto your Google listing. Right. Your product and services are not listed on there. There's no description about your business. There's not enough uh, photos uploaded onto your Google listing. So Google is prioritizing that 
of can those are all on your website, of course. But what ultimately Google is going after is minimal amount of clicks. So if somebody type in your home near me or cremation near me on the Google listing itself, it lists all of your products, services, how you're different, your pricing. There's right, then you just tap call. That's what Google really ultimately wants is to bypass your website. It's not hating your website, but it's right, it's want to deliver as much information as possible. They see a lot of good reviews and they just call, right? So that's still the first fundamental is the more information you put it onto a Google listing, the more likely Google trusts you. Second algorithm, not a surprise to any of us, are going to be your Google reviews. The more, the better. The more likely you will be ranked in the three pack. Third algorithm is something called citations. Citation is mentioning of your business name, address, and phone number in other directories. So this ranking was developed to prevent spams. So a lot of business owners or agencies they hire, they will create fake businesses, fake locations. So they might get a PO box here. They might get another fake address here. So that way they get ranked in the three pack across all these cities. But Google hates that practice. So what, <laughs> and sometimes it's hard for Google to know, right? What are, cause a lot of small businesses, they generally work from their home or they might get a PO box. So it's hard for Google to know whether this is a real business or not. So what it does is start to look at other directories for references. If you're a real business, you should have a Apple Maps listing. You should have a Yelp listing, you should have a Bing listing, right? So the more directories it appear on with the same name, address, and phone number, the more Google trusts you. And the fourth one, of course, is going to your website, your website content. So those four still hasn't changed a whole lot. Yeah, got it. You know, I, it's hard to like tell you exactly. I mean, you kind of broke it down, but <laughs> you can see the difference when you Google something and those three show up and you go to their business page and you usually compare it to maybe your business. And it, right. it's just, theirs looks so much more robust. Oh, yeah. A lot like, more there's content. so many more pictures. You have a really good idea. One of the things that I would say is that, you know, tech companies themselves, Google, Facebook, Reddit, all of these companies, they try really hard not to get you to leave their website. Oh, yeah. Right. So as much information as you can give Google to prevent that customer or that user from going to your website, right. they're going to prioritize that. Oh, yeah, definitely. Over a lot, right? right? Because once they go to your website, they don't get to see what no. you're doing. They don't get to control the experience, no. right? Right. But um, if you can make your Google business page so robust and have so much information that they don't need to go anywhere else and they can make that decision right there on that page, Google will reward you for that. Right. Yeah. It's also, it's also such a good differentiator. I mean, not many funeral homes really take the time or even have the know-how to build that out or are willing to like let you kind of bypass their website. They kind of want to feed you there. But in reality, right. a lot of them really want you to call so they can get you on the phone to, to sell you. And if you really care about your Google business page, that can be your best friend. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anytime somebody Googles your brand name, right, coming from referral source or coming from hospice, right, yeah. they will Google your brand name. Yeah. Like if your Google listing is <laughs> pretty, right, very little information on there. And right away they see, oh, wow, you're three star business. Uh, <laughs> no matter how good <laughs> of that referral source is, now they're second guessing. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Do you see anything becoming more important now in marketing, online advertising, making the phone ring for, for funeral homes? Outly, the fundamentals still the same. It's just really maximizing those channels then. and then knowing which one to fire off, sequencing, right? What I say is funeral owners, we, even me, we all have shiny metal syndrome. We're all like squirrels. Right. Mm -hmm. We heard of these fancy terminology, OTT, this and that, you know, fencing, <laughs> and I start jumping in those strategies. But the fundamentals are still the fundamentals. You want to master the fundamentals before you move on to these shiny metal stuff. Yeah. Um, but one thing I really do think, one thing that most funeral homes haven't tapped into are still working with hospices, right? 50% of the death occurs through a hospice these days. And that is growing. Yeah. And that to me is like, why aren't you 
yeah, you can spend more money with me, but yeah, no. <laughs> you should be working with your hospice. Yeah, I completely agree. 90% of hospice patients pa- pass within six months and 50% pass within three weeks. Mm-hmm. There, there's no better marketing channel right. <laughs> in death care. You know, right. the, the turnover at these businesses are extremely high right. and positioning yourself with the social workers oh, yeah. and chaplains yeah. and nurses mm-hmm. and administrators, oh, yeah. you can really build a moat. That's how we built our oh, business. Yeah. I completely agree. It's it's the best way to build a moat around it. Yeah, it's grassroots. Um, so now we know a lot more about hospice because we have a separate division called Hospice Haven Marketing. All we do is help hospices out. Yeah, and their their business all heavily rely on referral sources coming from sure. physicians, right? Sure. So yeah. what they do is they actually hire. A, a better way to say is, but you kind of get it, it's like pharmaceutical reps, right? Yeah. And they go network with physicians. They yeah. really have foot soldiers on the ground. Yeah. I hate to use that, but you get it, right? No, 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 they're really sure. networking, though. But most yeah. funeral homes, they're not networking at all, right? They have no boots on the ground to be building relationship with hospice. If I own a funeral home today, that will be the first thing I will hire, not spending money on digital market. I hate to say that, guys. You don't like destroy my own business. No, you're 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 yeah. my best marketing person. I'm I'm building a relationship marketing course. Yeah. Yeah. And so that <laughs> it makes it easier to do this because yeah. we built a 5,000 case business on these tactics. Yeah. And it's, it's extremely inexpensive. Right. <laughs> it's I, extremely mean, you, yeah, I mean, also, one thing you could think about is like, it's not absurd to say that it's going to cost you paying Google, mm-hmm. let's just say $200 to get one. Right, let's yeah. say thousand dollar direct cremation. Yeah. Like I think those are like general metrics right. that you should probably work on, yeah. right? right? If you wanted to get, let's say, five cases, that's a thousand dollars. I mean, you know how many muffins you can buy and go <laughs> give an in service <laughs> at hospices for a thousand dollars? Think about think, but, but even for two hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, two hundred dollars yeah. you can buy star. You can buy coffee and a nice spread. Go to a hospice right. that has five social workers and five nurses that have a, they have a census of a client base of 40 or 50 clients and you can establish a rapport with them. And if, even if you, if you get 10% of that census, that's 10 cases for $200. And if you establish that relationship and you answer your phone, treat the customers well, and they give good feedback to them, you can expect that the long tail effects for for years. Oh yeah. (laughs) For the same two hundred dollars. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it, it's don't, no, don't it's use a, Welton. Just go to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm being serious. Like why? It, it just it bugs no. me. Why? It's they should. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna hire you for my for marketing my course. For <laughs> 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 no, no, no. It really is hospice marketing so critical. And there's a there's a really good recipe for it. Mm-hmm. You know, and it aligns with the the vision of the entire industry, which is. Give, giving hospice the tools to serve families better, make make difficult situations easier for them, mitigates difficult situations for yourself, right. give them resources, give them a nice spread, establish a rapport. You also have a lot of the same problems that hospice workers encounter, exhaustion, burnout, you know, there's a, there's a lot to relate to, a lot to relate to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it'd be fun. We can have a separate episode to talk about, yeah. Hospice marketing. That'll be so I love it. Yeah, oh, I yeah. love it. I love it. And, and, a, and an AI one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That'll be oh. fun. Welton, what, uh, what's next for Ring Ring? I know you take it steady and slow, but I do know that you do make moves. So, steady so what? and slow. <laughs> Still <laughs> steady and slow. Yeah. We've been working well in working with mainly still funeral homes, right? 175 calls and above. Yeah. And still, that's our main bread and butter and it's still that's why it's like well we should chat offline it still bugs me that's why we started a separate division to be working with hospices mm-hmm. right because i really want to figure out how can they be working together even more uh yeah, it's mm-hmm. a way like i want to build a network where are we in that same city for example we have fair home clients and hospice clients and i want, really want to bridge them even more that really is what I really, my next passion is have the two work even closer together. Yeah. Well, 
Cool. Is there anything that we can check out or anything, or is it just something that's in the works right now? Uh, it's in the works, but we do have a separate website. If you go on Hospice Haven Marketing, <laughs> we do have uh, something quite readily. Uh, we're working with quite a bit of hospices. Right? That's great. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. I love that. <laughs> that's awesome. No, this is, this is great. I think really maturing the relationships between the death care industry and the end of life care yeah. healthcare oh, yeah. industry is, is a natural progression. Oh, yeah. And I think that there's still a lot of opacity between the two industries. Oh, and yeah. I think the more transparency that we can get, the better families will be served oh, and yeah. the higher satisfaction rates in both industries. Right. You'll, you'll see over oh, time. Yeah. yeah, I completely agree. Right. Yeah. We'll have a separate session on hospice. It's, uh, it's, that's my passion too. <laughs> Me, yeah, I, I I love educating hospice oh, yeah. workers. Oh, yeah. It's it's a bit of passion of mine oh, for yeah. a long time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, awesome. I didn't know that about you, Wilson. That's great. <laughs> awesome, cool. <laughs> All right. Well, um, yeah, today was a good episode. I don't. There was uh anything else that you guys want to talk about? We'll save it for the next two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you welton if you want to find welton you can find him at uh ring ring marketing.com uh hospice haven marketing yes dot com and uh yeah or you could find him at one of your favorite <laughs> death care shows as well but thank you for listening this is the reclamation podcast i'm tyler yamasaki my co-host will demichaelis bye everybody thank you for listening bye 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 Thank you so much for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. If you ever want to know more, please find us at directcremation.com. 